Welcome back for part two of our lecture on schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. In part one, we discussed the positive, negative, and disorganized sim symptoms of psychosis. In this lecture, we will review schizophrenia, risk for the development of the disorder, and its relationship to sociocultural factors such as poverty and stress. Schizophrenia rarely comes on as a continuous period of active psychosis with nothing else. Instead, it has stages. Typically, the first stage is the prodromal phase. So here you start to see changes, but the symptoms are much more mild than what's coming down the road. So they might have three months where they stay in bed most of the day, they're no longer being very talkative. They may start to do some things that seem odd or peculiar. Then at some point in time, they move into what we call the active phase of schizophrenia. During this time, you see hallucinations, delusions, disorganized behavior, all of these things are present and now they predominate their characterization. As we're diagnosing schizophrenia, they have to demonstrate these active phase symptoms for at least one month in order to qualify for a diagnosis of schizophrenia. The last phase then is the residual phase. This starts to look much more like that initial prodromal phase, but it's the residual phase because it's happening after they've had their active phase of psychosis. So here the symptoms tend to be more mild. They've already had their active psychosis and now it's diminished. So imagine three months after remission, they might still sense a presence of something being there or seeing someone behind them. But when they turn around, they don't actively see that person anymore, as an example. And they may have previously had tangential or even derailed speech. Now it's not that disorganized, but maybe their speech is still a bit vague, uh, not terribly direct and clear. Because they're no longer in the active phase does not mean that they're symptom free. They may have milder expressions of delusions, hallucinations, disorganized behavior. They're very likely to still have the negative symptoms. They're not gone altogether. Schizophrenia is what we call a cookbook criteria set because you only need to have two of the symptoms to qualify, but there are a variety of different symptoms that someone could have. As a result, the people that have the same diagnosis could actually have vastly different symptoms and manifestations of the disorder. So it's a heterogeneous symptom presentation when you look across all of those individuals diagnosed. There are, however, some essential features. When you hear about schizophrenia, you will often hear the phrase criterion A symptoms. What they're getting at there is that this is that point in time where they're having the active phase of schizophrenia. They're having delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. So they've, they've moved from potentially just having some of the declines to now manifesting these additional unusual experiences and behaviors. So they must have at least one, delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. But they have to have at least two out of the entire set of delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, or negative symptoms. What this means is someone could have delusions and hallucinations and nothing else. Another person might have hallucinations and disorganized speech and nothing else. Someone else might have hallucinations and negative symptoms. And we could keep going through all of the various combinations, but the bottom line is a lot of different ways will count under criterion A. But the critical piece about criterion A is that they show at least one month of delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech.
We also look at how have they been functioning since the onset of the disorder. To count, we have to see that at least one area of functioning has fallen off markedly since the disorder began. Perhaps they used to be able to keep a job, but they no longer can do so. Perhaps they previously had attended school and done reasonably well, but now they're no longer attending or they've bailed out. And then we look at the overall duration. And this one is sometimes a little bit tricky because we're looking for a full six months of illness. But we've only required that they show active phase symptoms for that one month period. So how do we come up with that six month time frame? Well, this means we are also allowing ourselves to include the prodromal and the residual phases. This means those time frames they may be less severe. Um, they may have, especially in the beginning, only had negative symptoms. Maybe they were even misdiagnosed as having depression for some period of time. But then we have that phase of active psychosis, and all together, they've hit that at least one six-month period of time. As always. We have the standard rules that it can't be better accounted for other disorders or the use of a substance or a general medical condition. But it's really important when we're talking about schizophrenia to be very thoughtful about some of the other disorders that could look very similar if we're not careful. This includes some that we're gonna talk about later today like schizoaffective disorder, but also, if you recall, we talked about bipolar one disorder with psychosis. Individuals can have mood congruent psychosis. Those would be different from schizophrenia. Schizophrenia might have depression or might have a mood episode, but it also might not. For schizophrenia, the psychosis is the primary symptom. But with a mood congruent psychosis, they only have these psychotic symptoms when they're in a mood episode. If they're not in a mood episode, then those symptoms are not there at all. For schizophrenia, whether or not they're depressed, you still see psychosis. And then we're gonna talk in greater depth about schizoaffective disorder, but here what we're seeing is that there's a period of time where they only have one set of symptoms, the psychosis, but then the majority of their disorder includes both psychosis and an active full-blown mood episode. Thankfully, the lifetime prevalence of schizophrenia in the general population is very low. It's less than 1% of the population. And there are some interesting debates about whether or not there's a difference in the prevalence by gender. Inpatient studies typically find that there are more men with schizophrenia, but community samples find that the rates of schizophrenia are fairly equal between the men and women. This is likely due to differences in the severity of the symptoms, and women are more likely to have less severe symptoms, have a good prognosis, and avoid hospitalization. So taking all of that together, we generally presume that the true prevalence rates are actually approximately equal. There's a wide range of onset, anywhere from late teens to mid thirties, but there are also interesting trends there as well. So the early, kind of the late teens to early to mid twenties are typically men. Whereas for women, the onset is typically the late 20s. There is a small group that will have onset before adolescence. There are cases even of five and six-year-olds getting this diagnosis, but that is extremely rare. And it also can begin later in life, but that's very rare as well. In fact, uh, some things to know about late onset is it's associated with a better prognosis been part of that is because they've had a greater portion of their life where they've had normal brain development. And so they find that there are fewer structure, structural abnormalities in the brain of those who had a later onset. Later onset indicates better prognosis. And another interesting piece of that is that very often 
that group that has the late onset, it's higher among women, and the very late onset is almost exclusively women. And there typically has been among those who are postmenopausal. And the belief is that estrogen was actually helping to protect against the development of schizophrenia. And with the estrogen drop, it then increased their risk. There are many comorbidities with schizophrenia. Over half will have some depression. Over 5%, 5 to 6% will actually die from suicide. And in fact, 10% of all completed suicides are linked to psychotic illnesses. 20% will attempt suicide at least once. But again, part of the difficulty here is it's not clear if this really was a desire to die or if this was in response to command hallucinations to harm themselves. We know that suicide risk is highest among those with schizophrenia that are young, male, with comorbid substance abuse. And other factors that tend to increase their risk are hopelessness, being unemployed, they're at greater risk immediately after a psychotic episode or after being discharged from the hospital. Before we go any further, let's watch a video about living with schizophrenia. <laughs> Hammer and I have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a mental illness that changes the way you think, feel, and act. It's broken down into three separate categories positive, negative, and cognitive. Positive symptoms don't mean they're a good thing, it's an add on to your normal behavior. Things like hallucinations, delusions, and voices. You know, I had so many ghosts and shadows inside of my mind. A demon was perching on the end of my bed. Negative symptoms take away from your behavior. I showed no emotion, and I was just totally out of it. Cognitive symptoms make it hard to pay attention and hard to focus. Your brain is just racing. You can't stop. The pathology of these illnesses has only become recently understood. Schizophrenia is different for everyone. My symptoms aren't like everybody else's. My first symptom of schizophrenia was pretty much just zoning out, thinking I was in a different place, and it turned into kind of voices in my head that just played me over and over again. I thought my mother was trying to hurt me. I didn't know what to do about anything because I thought everyone had it out for me, so I didn't know who to go to for help. Sometimes I kind of hear a voice more coming from the right side of my head saying like, everyone hates you, stop what you're doing, don't do anything, nothing, nothing. Well, it's kind of like the other side of me is kind of arguing back with the voice. Don't worry about anything, chill, just chill, breathe, chill, just chill, you can get through it. It's kind of just like the thing is, who's going to win, who's going to win, who's going to win? When I take my medicine, the good sign wins. I mean, living in the city and having schizophrenia is interesting just because, you know, I do hear voices as I'm walking down the street. So in my head, I'm thinking of the person talking to me, but then I start talking back to the person. And then maybe I'll snap out of it, look around, and like five people are staring at me. But mostly I kind of just get plagued by thoughts that are just so repetitive in my head, and then they just go around over and over and over again. And really, I just want it to be nice and quiet and silent. All through high school, I had this like really crazy paranoid delusion that my mother was trying to kill me. Every time she went to try to get me to a therapist or anything, because she knew something wasn't right, I always thought she was trying to ruin my life. So when I went to college, I thought I was free of her, and everything was great. And then all of a sudden, my best friend, my roommate, I started thinking the exact same things about her. 
So realizing that I had the problem was like the start of the entire thing. And that was the hardest thing to do, I think, realizing there was a problem. At 18, I was told I was bipolar, but I kind of knew that diagnosis was incorrect. So at 22, I spoke to a different doctor and I was more honest with him and he diagnosed me with bipolar. schizophrenia and that was like the best thing that ever happened to me because he got me on the right medication and I feel as good as I can possibly feel right now. I finally told a therapist about what was going on with me. I had all these problems and I finally had a name for them. Over time we've realized that mental illness is nothing more than physical illness. Talk to as many people as you can. Don't be ashamed. Don't be judgmental. I see a psychiatrist every other week and we just kind of talk about things that are going on. Mostly I just share really silly stories with him and we just laugh a lot when really he's measuring just my mood. That's what I know he's doing. My medication, I take seven daily medications, six in the morning. One at night. The ones in the morning just get me ready for the day, get me focused, make it so I can get out of bed without having a horrible day. And the one at night just keeps me kind of leveled, knocks me out, and lets me have a good sleep without completely panicking in the middle of the night. It can be very lonely having the schizophrenia, the paranoia, the fear, the voices, everything that goes along with it. The compliance with medications is going to ultimately lead to a recovery. And your son or daughter can not only be okay, but they can be great again. It took a process of almost 10 years to get me on the right medication, but I'm glad that I finally am. People think that just because you're on medicine that the voices will completely stop, but you, you just can't stop the voices. With medication, it's more positive listening. It's more just zoning out. As long as I'm not thinking of negative, horrible things. My soul is leaking out of my body. I just saw a human being empty. I'm good. So you can't turn the voices off. You can just make them to what you prefer to hear. Be conscious of something that will take your attention from that negative situation into a positive one. And, you know, it takes a lot of discipline, but little by little, it becomes a habit. One in five New Yorkers has a mental health issue, but people don't talk about it because of all the stigma. There's still a lot of stigma, but people are starting to understand it a little bit better. Kind of like a big reason why I started my clothing line is that um, I was on the subway and I looked down the subway train and there was a homeless schizophrenic guy just talking to himself. And I noticed it was in the same exact mannerisms as I do it. So I kind of thought to myself, what's the difference between me and this guy? And I realized if I didn't have my friends, my family, my doctor, I could so easily be in his position. Part of the reason I started my whole business was to just tell everybody that I have schizophrenia. Showing people you can live a completely normal life, medicated, and be a completely normal person. And my whole thing is, if everyone would just kind of tell people that they have a mental illness, there wouldn't be so much stigma. There really shouldn't be any stigma. That needs to go away. Mental illness is so common. How can there be so much stigma? So I kind of wanted to do something that could raise awareness, give back to the mentally ill homeless community, and just kind of make a difference. Hi, how are you guys doing? Schizophrenic NYC was all made by me, Schizophrenic New Yorker, trying to change the way in our city's mental health, especially the mentally ill homeless. Donate a portion of the province to help them out. Yeah. I just pack up my bag, I wheel it over my shop every Saturday, and I just sell my merch, and I talk to amazing people. Yesterday I met two people that work in a psych ward. We had the greatest conversation about psych wards. They totally bought something for me, and they took my card, and they're like, we love what you're doing. This is so great. You know, mental health professionals love what I'm doing. They always think it's great. I've gotten negative reactions. Like one lady came up to my booth last year and says, I can't believe you would name a business this. This is offensive. And I'm a mental health advocate. This is offensive. And she took my flyer and ran away. And I was like, can I tell you about it? I'm a mental health advocate too. And she just ran away. And I was like, isn't that stigma? Aren't you judging me before I even tell you about it? Stigma right there.
It's just pretty awesome. It's not a delusion. You are incredible. Some common questions that I get is, what medications are you on? Mostly by people in the mental health field, they want to know. Other common questions are like, how to like handle somebody in a crisis. I mean, definitely never tell them that they're wrong. Don't try to take away their feelings. You always have to be sympathetic. I would try to convince them that they should seek professional help. Find a good doctor, find the meds that work. If you try hard enough and you really want to fix it, you can. Don't take your medication feel better and then think you don't need your medication anymore. It took a lot of pride that I had to say, I need medication and I'm just going to take it. My advice to someone who's going through it is be honest. If you keep telling people you're fine, they'll believe it. I believe there is a component beyond medical treatment that it has to be with education and creating positive voices that can influence and override the negative ones. Just because they have schizophrenia doesn't mean they can't be someone who will contribute to society who can make the world a better place. What a wonderful message. What we now know is that there is a lot that can be done, even with our very, very severe and highly genetic conditions, to dramatically change the course of schizophrenia, to change what ends up happening to people and how they are able to function with schizophrenia. I love her message and I love um, how she is working hard to destigmatize mental illness and reminding us of the reality that it's far more likely that you will either be someone with or know and love someone with mental illness than it is that you will not. Let's talk about the typical course of schizophrenia as well as some of the various courses that we've seen when we look at it around the world. What's very common is that individuals will show the prodromal symptoms first, followed by the active symptoms and then residual symptoms. But there is a vast wide range and quite a bit of variability in what kind of symptoms individuals may have. Some will show a pattern of remissions, meaning they get better, but then they get worse again, and then they get better and worse again. Others will remain chronically ill and will have that active phase of symptoms for a solid few decades straight. And there are even a handful of cases we know of, of there being a single acute episode of psycho psychosis and then they're symptom free and it never comes back. When we talk about the length of time of these different phases, what's very common here in the United States is that people will have a period of time with those prodromal symptoms and the prodromal symptoms are primarily defined with negative, the negative symptoms. So they're starting to be, have a motivation. They don't want to get out of bed. They are not really talking to people. They don't seem to be happy. Again, this for many will look like a severe depressive episode. And this can last potentially for months. Typically then the active phase hits and people may have that for many, many, many years, even several decades. Psychosis is related to dopamine. Dopamine declines as we get older. Hence, the active phase psychotic symptoms will often begin to decline as we age. Positive symptoms are also those symptoms that are most amenable to medication. The negative symptoms least. So when we give someone an antipsychotic medication, we will often see those active psychosis symptoms disappear. But if they have a lot of negative symptoms, those are likely to stay and to not really be helped by the medication. And this makes sense because antipsychotics work on the dopamine system. And psychotic symptoms are related to dopamine. But unfortunately, the negative symptoms and the cognitive deficits 
will continue after their active phase of schizophrenia has ended. And how severe that is, is actually predicted by what their prodromal phase looked like. If they had a very short, very mild prodromal phase, then they're likely to return to similar functioning and their residual phase. There are several indicators that we can use to expect that somebody is likely to have a good prognosis despite the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And some of these seem a little bit silly to say, I'll admit, because they just kind of make common sense. Yet and still, it is a good indication of what the course of the disorder is gonna be like for any one person. So one, good pre-morbid adjustment. Meaning the people that were doing better in before the disorder hit are likely to be the ones that continue to do better. Acute onset, meaning there was no prodromal phase. Remember, prodromal phase is where they have the negative symptoms, the decline in functioning, but there are people who do not have a prodromal phase. They literally go from having no symptoms to being in the active episode with hallucinations, delusions, and all of those kinds of behaviors. It seems very strange to people that someone who has acute onset could actually do better. And part of that, I think, is our cognitive dissonance with this idea of somebody could be fine and be doing really well, and then in a moment's notice, they can be completely different. But those individuals actually are the ones that do better. And it makes sense if you think about what happens if you've had a lengthy prodromal phase. So that means if we think about two people who had their onset at 25, one person went to high school, they did post-secondary, whatever, whether it maybe is tech training, they are in a job, they have friends, they have paid off their student loan debt, then one day they start hearing voices. Compare that to the second 25 year old diagnosed with schizophrenia, but now they've had a long prodromal phase. This individual started looking severely depressed, maybe at, in high school, started have a, having a motivation, disinterest in talking to others, started having poor hygiene and not getting up and out of bed. They didn't finish high school as a result. They were unable to stay motivated and to kind of get any better. And they eventually ended up homeless. Then at age 25, they have the onset of their first delusions and hallucinations. That long prodromal phase interrupts life. It limits the progress they can make on achieving general life goals. It increases the amount of structural abnormalities they're likely to have in their brain because they've had this long period of disrupted development. And that long prodromal period could end up disrupting friendships, disrupting their education, disrupting their financial lives, so both people starting to have active psychosis at age 25 look vastly different if they had a prodromal phase or if they had no prodromal phase. For the same reasons, later age of onset is a better prognosticator. They've simply had more time to accomplish things, to grow, to develop, for their brain to mature before the symptoms started. Female gender tends to be a good prognostic. The relationship for that is a bit complicated. One, we know that estrogen regulates dopamine. So women's hormone levels help to regulate the, the onset as well as the severity of the symptoms by moderating dopamine. So women who do get it tend to get it later, which also improves the likelihood of them having positive life outcomes. Their symptoms tend to be milder, partially because of the estrogen regulating dopamine. So for a variety of different reasons, 
female gender ends up being a good indicator of a positive prognosis. Brief duration of the active phase symptoms. Again, this makes sense. If we think of somebody who, yes, they met criteria for schizophrenia, but they had only one year of active phase symptoms, then they went back to maybe the residual, or they went back to a normal, or they went back to a phase where they had only some of the, the residual symptoms versus somebody who has active delusions and hallucinations for 30 years. The first person is going to do better having had them only for one year versus the one who has it for 30 years. Interestingly, if there is a stressor, traumatic event that immediately occurs before the onset of the disorder, that can be another positive indicator. We know that schizophrenia develops because they have a pre-existing disposition and then they are encountered with stressors. That combination is what leads to the onset of the disorder. But again, for some people that might be a year of a prodromal phase, but for these individuals, if there is a stressor and then they immediately go into that phase, that means they did not have that interrupted time that you see with those who have this longer prodromal phase. Another one that sounds kind of silly is good interepisode functioning. Individuals who have schizophrenia, even though even those who are in the active phases for a number of years, it doesn't mean they're having the same level of psychosis for the entire 40 years. They probably have times where things got a little better and things got a little worse and things get better again and things get a little worse. The time in between episodes is what we call inter-episodes. And then we look at how did they function during those spaces in between episodes. So the people that are able to function better in between those episodes tend to have better, all, better outcomes overall. Again, that just kind of makes sense. The people doing better continue to do better than the ones that are not doing as well. Minimal residual symptoms is a positive sign. But again, this just goes back to the idea that if you don't have a lot of those negative symptoms that continue in the residual phase, that means that you're pretty much returning to being symptom free once your active phase ends. So that's gonna be a very good sign. And if there's no family history of schizophrenia, that tends to be a positive indicator for, for the long-term prognosis. This graph gives you a quick view of the age of first diagnosis for schizophrenia. This only includes people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia and the bars show the proportion that are diagnosed at each age. Some important things to pick up from this is one, look at the differences between males and females. Males are always the first bar in this chart and then women. And so you see that there's consistently higher rates for men after age 15, but then that begins to change by age 35. This is showing that men tend to have earlier onset, so their onset's happening at 15, 20, 25. Fewer women are being diagnosed at that point in time. But then after 35, the rates of new cases begin to be primarily among women. And again, that's that shift that's happening with menopause and with the drop in estrogen no longer protecting their dopamine or modulating their dopamine. And so now that risk for women goes up and it's very rare for men. This next graph is a different way of looking at some of the same material. This is showing the age of risk for developing schizophrenia. This is a cumulative proportion. So you can see that by age 50, almost anyone who will ever have schizophrenia has already developed the disorder. So we have no, perhaps there's a case out there, but really there are no cases that develop after age 50. 
you can also see that only 10% or so will develop schizophrenia after age 40. And again, that age of risk, we're seeing the biggest jump is happening between ages 15 and 25 years of age. The next few slides show the link between risk for developing schizophrenia based on the percentage of genes that two people share. First, we see that identical twins sharing 100% of their DNA will only have about a 48% concordance rate. So if one of the twins has schizophrenia, there's only a 48% chance that the other will develop schizophrenia as well. This is really quite impressive given that they share 100% of their DNA. We also know that identical twins have uh, increased envi shared environment because they shared a womb and they tend to go through things at the same kinds of environmental events at the same developmental stages. And with all of that, we still only see a 48% concordance. This is important to remember because this would tell you that there's something significant about the environmental contributions to the development of schizophrenia. Going on, we see that first degree relatives where 50% of their genes are shared, have a 17% risk among fraternal twins. Other siblings only have a 9% risk and children of those with schizophrenia have a 13% risk. Take a minute here to think about why would we see so much higher a risk among fraternal twins compared to any random sibling pair? Both share 50% of their DNA with one another. This goes back to thinking about some of the things we've talked about all semester and talked about just recently, that fraternal twins actually are not just like any regular sibling pair. Fraternal twins shared the same prenatal environment by sharing a womb. They also are at generally the same developmental stage whenever they are experiencing life events and potential stressors. Whereas other siblings typically are going to be a minimum of eight months different in development and they did not have that shared womb. So fraternal twins do have an increased risk compared to other siblings because of all of those factors. Also think about well, why is it that children of those with schizophrenia have this increased risk, almost similar to fraternal twins. The likely story here is that having a parent with severe mental illness is incredibly stressful and may actually act as the needed stressor to activate that pre-existing risk. This chart shows the same information for second and third degree relatives who share 25% and 12.5% of their DNA respectively. You can see that the first cousin of someone with schizophrenia has only a 2% risk of developing schizophrenia his or herself. So it's dropped considerably even at the level of first cousins. Finally, this shows the risk for the general population and for spouses of those with schizophrenia. And you can see that once we are talking about the general population or spouses, these rates are not very different from the rates for first cousins. So it, it, it went very low very quickly. It's interesting though here, if you don't share any of the DNA, any shared DNA, why are we seeing that spouses of patients have double the risk than grabbing any random person off the street. There's a couple of theories to this. One may also be the stress of having a spouse with a significant and serious mental illness. There may also be some selection biases that you know either where people met and fell in love may be related to already having some kind of mental uh, illness symptoms. Um, for example, if they had met at a meeting for people that were struggling with some of these kinds of symptoms. So there's several different ideas about why this might be happening. This chart demonstrates the impact of social class on schizophrenia. The first bars in this graph are the proportion of the general population in that particular SES group. 
So we see roughly just under 30% are in the lower SES group out of the entire population. Nearly 60% of the population is considered middle class and roughly 15% of the population is considered upper class. The next set of these bars shows how many of those hospitalized with schizophrenia belong to each of those class groups. So among those diagnosed with schizophrenia, approximately 50% of them are low SES. Another almost 50%, a little bit lower, maybe 48%, are from the middle class. And only two or three percent are from high SES groups. What may be jumping out at you immediately is that it appears that schizophrenia is underrepresented in the upper classes. If you compare the proportion of the population in that group and the rate of schizophrenia, it's striking in how low it is. It also then seems to be overrepresented among the middle class and then severely overrepresented among those in the lower class. Almost 96% of the inpatient sample are from the lower and the middle class. This might imply that there are better treatment options for those in the upper class, or they may have some other resources that keep them out of inpatient facilities. There's also likely to be significant differences in what their life experiences are that may actually be the reason that they've developed schizophrenia in the first place. For example, going back to our diathesis stress model, we can have a pre-existing predisposition, but if we don't have the necessary stressors, we're unlikely to develop the disorder in the end. So given the additional stresses among the lower and middle class, perhaps they are encountering more of those kinds of stressors, particularly in the lower class, that is part of why they are dr dra dramatically overrepresented among those with schizophrenia. Conversely, those in the high SES group may be able to do things that buffer them from stressors and to help with early intervention if they encounter stressors that may be part of why their risk is minimized. And despite the age of these data, a recent review of all the research that's been conducted since 2001 continues to find that low social class is associated with increased risk of developing schizophrenia and increased severity of schizophrenia. This brings us to an end of the second part in our three parts on schizophrenia spectrum. Be sure to watch part three on other psychotic disorders.